Hi everyone. I thought it might help some students if I recorded a few mini lectures based upon the PowerPoint slides that I'll have posted on Blackboard for you. So these are much abbreviated versions of my normal in-class lectures, so we'll be skipping through stuff really, really quickly. So I would definitely encourage you to please take a look at your textbook for a, a more in-depth discussion of many of the ideas that I simply just don't have time to talk about in this video format. So anyway, let's get started. Please keep in mind that at the start of every single PowerPoint slide set that I have for you, there's a list of lecture terms, and these are a wonderful resource for when you get ready to sit down and start studying for the exams. These are your are going to be your BFFs, okay? There, there's just no getting around it. You really need to have these terms that are found at the start of every single PowerPoint slide set. You really need to have these memorized so that you can perform well on the exams. So this course in world history begins with prehistory, an era that we need to understand on its own terms, and an era that actually is a little bit hard for us to decode for one simple reason. Prehistoric human beings didn't leave us any written records. History is the study of human events as recorded by humans themselves. Therefore, Prehistory is the study of human events before there were any written records. Getting at how early human beings lived, what their day-to-day -day lives were like, is incredibly difficult as a result of this lack of written records. We don't have any handy diaries or law codes uh, to let us know what these people were thinking and feeling, um, you know, how they may have coped with things like grief or um, how they may have worried over their future or the concept of an afterlife. These things are just not there for us to be able to decode. So instead, historians of the prehistoric era have to yield the floor to experts in a couple of other areas, archaeology and anthropology. These folks are much better prepared. They are the ones that go out and can not only excavate the remains, the physical remains of these people, but also unearth their tools and weapons. And they can also analyze these things and tell us a great deal about who these people were just by, in some cases, the trash that they left behind. In the instance of skeletal remains, quite a bit can be told um, about the lives of these earliest peoples through the work of forensic anthropologists who can analyze the skeletal remains of early peoples. They can immediately tell us, for example, whether or not a skeleton is that of a male or a female. If it's a female, they can look for certain markers on the pelvic bone that, that tell us whether or not she gave birth. They can look at things like the um, wear patterns on their teeth to give us a little bit of a sense of what type of a diet these people may have had. They can look at the growth plates on the bones and they can uh, tell whether or not these earliest people said had a very limited diet or in fact had to endure periods of famine that may have stunted their growth. They can also look at the material with which weapons and tools are made out of the decorative patterns on bowls or uh, pottery that they've left behind to, to kind of give us a sense of who these people were and perhaps most importantly who they traded with. Now most of us are familiar with the concept of evolution and the fact that organisms will change and some will die off and others that adapt to their environment will uh, live long enough to reproduce and move and spread across the landscape. The same is true of the human family tree. You can see many different branches that have gotten us to the present day, which is Homo sapiens. And you can see that this process uh, took place over millions and millions and millions of years. What we're really finding out, something uh, particularly interesting about Homo sapiens, our most recent human ancestor, is that it overlapped in time and overlapped geographically with uh, H. neanderthalensis, which most of us think of as Neanderthal man. And that, perhaps more importantly, these two groups not only were around one another, but that they interbred. 
for instance, very recent DNA analysis of um, the excavated skeletons of Neanderthal when you, uh, in cases of being able to extract DNA from those skeletal remains, they've been able to sequence uh, the DNA of that, that particular human species that is no longer with us and contrast that with Homo sapiens, which is who we are today. And what forensic anthropologists have been able to determine is that Homo sapiens very likely interbred with um, Neanderthal man because today if you are of European or Asian ancestry we still uh, uh, those that that are from this ancestry have about one to four percent of their DNA that comes from Neanderthal ancestors. So Homo sapiens is where we're at today um, Homo sapiens oftentimes translates into thinking one or a wise one. And we know geographically that Homo sapiens likely developed about 200 to 300,000 years ago in portions of present-day Central Africa and then over the intervening hundreds of thousands of years likely spread apart into uh, spread out into Eurasia and to other areas um, of uh, the so-called Old World. Now there are several characteristics of Homo sapiens that uh, tend to uh, indicate that it is not quite the same species as the, the many that preceded it on the human family tree. Now it does bear some similarities. Uh, certainly Homo sapiens does to Neanderthal. As I mentioned earlier, the two populations likely interbred, uh, may have gone to war with one another as well as made peace. Uh, these things we're still trying to figure out, but Neanderthal certainly walked upright as did Homo erectus and a few other species. But when we refer to some characteristics that set Homo sapiens apart, we still we still look at uh, such general characteristics as their upright posture, moving from all fours to uh, simply walking on hind legs. This is going to confer a number of survival benefits to Homo sapiens. Being able to stand upright, for example, will increase the line of sight for Homo sapiens, meaning they're standing taller and their horizon is expanded. What this means is that Homo sapiens will have to start relying upon its sense of sight a lot more than the other senses. And uh, for that reason, sight will become clearer, sharper. We have binocular vision, which helps us uh, detect movement very quickly. Uh, that these things, because of an expanded line of vision, will give Homo sapiens uh, an evolutionary advantage in enabling our ancestors to spot prey animals more quickly so that they can they can kill and and, uh, and eat also will help them spot predator animals that would love to kill and eat uh, homo sapiens as part of this process too all these these three characteristics are actually very much intertwined with one another but moving on to the concept of a larger brain homo sapiens will develop uh, a much larger brain than, than our previous human ancestors some of that will have to do with uh, its increased reliance upon vision among the other senses to develop very acute binocular color vision that is capable of tracking motion quickly. Uh, that takes a lot of processing power, we might say, um, in, in thinking about modern terms with computers, for instance. Uh, if you play games on the internet, uh, you understand that you need a really um, high-powered processor in your computer to process those those uh, you know hundreds of thousands of images within a very short time frame uh, to to load the game so that you end up having a sort of a seamless experience. Well, the same is true for vision with Homo sapiens. The brain is constantly processing even now, especially amongst us in the 21st century. We're constantly processing thousands and thousands of images from minute to minute, and our brain has to knit those independent images together so that we can track movement, so that everything is part of a seamless whole. That requires a tremendous amount of brain activity and brain power. Also, taxing the brain and requiring it to grow and, and make new neural connections is this last characteristic, Homo sapiens using tools. When human beings go from walking on all four limbs to only walking on two limbs, it frees up these hands, and with these hands, since they're no longer needed for locomotion, 
human beings will look for other uses for these appendages. It might be uh, helping to reach to secure nuts or berries or fruits from trees. It might involve tool formation, which is incredibly important. Crafting weapons, crafting other tools that help make certain tasks a lot easier to complete. Well, all that manual dexterity that is required of using these hands for um, very tiny purposes, um, very when which precision is 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 very necessary. All that too requires a much larger brain. We also know that Homo sapiens was developing a tool that you may not think of it as a tool, but it certainly is, that tool being language, spoken language, which will be invaluable in communicating sometimes life-saving information between our earliest ancestors. Homo sapiens existed during the so-called Paleolithic era. Paleo meaning old and lithic meaning stone. So another name for the Paleolithic era is the Old Stone Age, and we often refer to it as this time period. This time period from whenever, we don't have a fixed uh, date on the front end of this, but from prehistory to about 10,000 BC. We call it the Stone Age because this is the primary material with which human beings are fashioning their weapons and tools. During this era, human beings are living a so-called hunter-gatherer lifestyle and they're having to roam around quite a bit to get what they need from the environment to stay alive. They are having to hunt daily. They are having to gather edible fruits or nuts or roots from trees and bushes just to stay alive. And when we talk about people moving around a lot out of necessity, they can't stay in one place for very long because they're following herds of bison or antelope or what have you. We talk about these people living a nomadic existence, a very difficult way to eke out a living, this hunter-gatherer existence. Now, one huge technological step forward for early humans was learning how to harness fire Learning how to start a fire on demand is incredibly important. The heat from the fire can keep you from, uh, you know, dying of hypothermia. The fire itself is a deterrent to would-be animal predators because animals are naturally afraid of fire. Uh, also quite important from the standpoint of being able to cook your food and kill any potential pathogens that might be in that food that would like you to be its next host. Uh, being able to cook your meat before consumption also helps these people survive much, much easier. We also know that human beings were using fires in caves in which they sought refuge from the elements. They're moving around a lot. It doesn't make sense for them to stay in one place and, and build an airtight, watertight structure. So they're taking refuge in, in cliff dwellings, in caves. And we know that they were there because they've left us a lot of clues, cave paintings. We know that while they were sitting up around the fire after the sun would go down, they were likely not only decorating, in some cases, their environment, but talking sharpening and honing their physical tools and weapons and also sharpening and honing and expanding the tool of language, telling stories, exchanging information. All these things are critical for the development of early human societies. And perhaps the biggest leap forward in technology will be the Neolithic Revolution, where human beings begin to practice agriculture. They learn how to grow crops for themselves. Doing this will provide an immediate and much more stable source of food, meaning these folks no longer have to live a nomadic existence. They can start settling into permanent communities, constructing better housing to keep them out of the elements. This will lead to a longer life expectancy. That, too, will lead to a higher birth rate. The longer people live, the more chances they have to reproduce successfully. Also important will be the concept of the division of labor. Now, since not everyone's labor is needed to secure food, this frees up people to become carpenters, artists, uh, child care laborers. Um, this is really the beginnings of early organized human society. And in some of these societies, when they produce more of items than they need to consume, a surplus develops of certain items. When they have more than what they need, 
This leads to trade between various settlements. Trade which starts out as the so-called barter system. 